So why don't we open with a word of prayer and then Amen. we'll go on there. We go. <laughs> Lord, we are thankful for the opportunity to be together again, to share in your word, to be strengthened um, by the fellowship we share as well. We pray for Pastor John and his work with the orphanage, which I think is very challenging at this point. And we pray for all of us here that we might be your people in all that we do. We pray these things in Jesus name. Amen. 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 All right. So I think we are at chapter 11, verse 7. Everybody wants to go there. And if somebody wants to read 7 through 15, remember we're now, Paul is confronting the people in Corinth about what he kind of refers to as the super apostles, all of these really great apostles who are um, dissing poor Paul. <laughs> and so he's responding to that. So 7 to 15. Did I commit a sin in abasing myself so that you might be exalted? because I preached God's gospel without cost to you. I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve <laughs> you. And when I was with you and was in want, I did not burden anyone for my needs were supplied by the brethren who came from Macedonia. So I refrained and will refrain from burdening you in any way. As the truth of Christ is in me, this boast of mine shall not be silenced in the regions of what? Okay. Achaia. And, and why? Because I do not love you. God knows I do. And what I do, I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission, they work on the same terms as we do. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen dis, um, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguise, disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is not strange if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, their end will correspond to their deeds. All right. So remember, this chapter starts out with Paul kind of responding to the to the um, charge that people say, ah, he's foolish, he's, you know, not really up to par or whatever. And he starts out by saying, okay, I'll give you a little foolishness. <laughs> I'll boast about my own kind of thing, which normally Paul is very much about not boasting, but for a minute he says, okay, I'll be foolish and I'll boast about what I'm about. And what am I about? Getting myself in trouble all the time. He lists all these things that, you know, in normal society of that day, people would say, that's not a good recommendation of you. That's a bad recommendation of you. But Paul says, but in the gospel, everything gets turned upside down. What looks good is, is not so good. And now he's responding in this to a second accusation um, that Paul doesn't love them. And why do they say he doesn't love them? Anybody figure out what he is saying in this kind of discourse here? Because they aren't paying him like they should. Like yeah, yeah. Other, other, other churches, you let help you by paying you, but you don't let us help you by paying you money, giving you money for the ministry. And he says, well, I just didn't want to be a burden. <laughs> it's not that I don't love you. It's not that I don't care for you. It's that I, I ultimately, it's because I do care for you. I knew you couldn't, you know, you didn't have the resources that they did to help. So <laughs> it's not about that. Um, and then he talks about those false apostles who are kind of like stirring all this up. And what does he call them? Disguised apostles. Disguised yes. apostles who are really working for. Satan. Satan. That seems pretty harsh. <laughs> you guys are working for Satan. But what does the word Satan mean? Anybody know? No. The accuser. 
So they are accusing him <laughs> of, of being false, of not being an apostle. Um, so in accusing Paul, these apostles are damaging the unity of the church, breaking down the unity, uh, unity of the church. And so they are in small and dangerous ways altering the message of the gospel. And Paul says this accusation is in line what's, with what Satan's about. It's contrary to what God is about. So he's putting it all pretty much on the line here. But it's in one of the things that I, I had never re realized about this passage that N.T. Wright talks about is he's being very um, flippant in some ways. Yeah, I'm foolish. So I'll, I'll, I'll boast in ways that you might find foolish, but they really are the reality of what the gospel is about. And those people who you are all kind of following, or at least some of the people in Corinth are following, um, they're really the foolish ones. <laughs> he was no, they're to, boasting according to all the normal good things that society looks at. He's trying to endear himself to them, right? Because he's not, he's not taking uh, remuneration as the other churches in North of there did yeah. to give him. And they, they evidently were endeared to him a little more than even the Corinthians, <laughs> you know? Well, no, I think it, it, it's, he's, he does find them dear, but he wants to assure them that everything that he does is for your sake. It's not somehow that I'm, you know, doing all these things for myself or to make myself better. I'm doing this for your sake. Yes, do we have to do something? Nope, I think he just hasn't got his camera on. Oh, okay. <laughs> you are there, John, right? Yep. There, there he is. is. <laughs> we're at chapter 11. We're just talking about verses 7 through 15. Okay. Where Paul's talking about these false apostles and assuring the people in Corinth that just because he didn't take money from them doesn't mean he doesn't love them. <laughs> <laughs> just they weren't in a position to help and so you know because i care about you i didn't you know and um trying to get them to realize that it's the people who are accusing him who are really the false ones are really the foolish ones are really the ones who aren't doing the will of god um and paul will continue that image as we move into verses 16 to the first part of 21 somebody want to read that I repeat, <clears throat> let no one take me for a fool, but if you do, then receive me just as you would a fool, so that I may do a little boasting. In this self-confident boasting, I'm not talking as the Lord would, but as a fool. Since many are boasting in the way the world does, I too will boast. You gladly put up with fools since you are so wise. In fact, you even put up with anyone who enslaves you or explo exploits you or takes advantage of you or pushes you pushes himself forward or slaps you in the face. To my shame, I admit that we were too weak for that. So in other words, these people who are claiming wisdom and strength and everything are people who are willing to take advantage of them, exert their power and authority to gain things from them. And Paul says, I'm just too weak for that. <laughs> I can't do that kind of thing. That's not, that's not who I am. And if the world calls that foolish, fine. Then that's, that's what you'll think about it. But um, again, he's reminding them that the gospel flips all that upside down. Um, others have been boasting and calling Paul a few, fool, but they're the fools, really, Paul says. Um, and Paul now is beating them at their own game. <laughs> willing to accept their claims to show how ludicrous those claims really are. And he boasts of his weakness. But earlier, remember what he said about weakness. What did Paul say earlier in both 1st and 2nd Corinthians, I think, about weakness? Anybody remember? Said so something about in my weakness his strength or the strength of god is made manifest so that my weakness is where god is most active um we we find our strength then in jesus 
And he also points out, look, by the world's standards, what was Jesus? Failure. Failure, foolish, weak. That's how the world saw Jesus. And so, but in my weakness, I'm reflecting the power and strength and authority of God. Where those who are claiming this strength are instead proving how weak they truly are. Again, it's flipping everything upside down. So somebody want to read then the rest of uh, chapter 11 then? But whatever anyone dares to boast of, I am speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast of that. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I'm talking like a madman, madman. I am a better one with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless floggings, and often near death. Five times I have received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I received a stoning. Three times I was shipwrecked. For a night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from bandits, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers and sisters, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, hungry and thirsty, often without food, cold and naked. And besides other things, I am under daily pressure because of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble and I am not indignant? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, blessed be for he be forever, knows that I do not lie. In Damascus, the governor under King Aretas guarded the city of Damascus in order to seize me, but I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped from his hands. Somebody else was put in a basket. <laughs> So, what's he boasting about then? Everything he's gone through. Okay. Survival. Survival. Good one. That's. And all because of his message about Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's actually more than Jesus had, except to the point of death. <laughs> but he didn't oh, stop God. there. What? <laughs> he didn't stop. Nope, he didn't stop. Yeah. Kept going. Now, again, just to give you a sense of the irony, if somebody came up, you know, and we didn't know that all this was in the name of Christ, that, you know, this is what Paul is saying, <clears throat> how would people look on someone who said, yeah, all this happened to me? He must have been a thief or something. <laughs> he, he would be branded as below <laughs> contempt. In fact, the last line is really interesting. Again, this was something I didn't know until I was doing some research on it. There was a one of the greatest honors if you were a military person was if you were in like the siege of a city and you were like the first one over the wall. You would get a big decoration for being the first one over the wall. Um, of course, to get that decoration, because lots of people would declare that they were the first one over the law. Well, if you wanted to be decorated for it, you had to go before the gods of the empire and say, I swear by all the gods, I was the first one over the wall. And you don't do that lightly because that's, <laughs> that's a good way to get yourself in trouble. And then they would give you this decoration. What, what Paul says is, I went over the wall 
to escape. <laughs> In fact, he says, I swear by Jesus Christ that I was went over the wall to escape. So it's kind of the flip side of what society would say, oh, these things are all the great com condom or commendations that you get as a good person. Paul is the reverse of all those. But he reverses all those in his in saying, and all this was done to the glory of God. Not to me, but to the glory of God, I did all these things. Um, and so if you want to, again, call me a fool, like all these other apostles are saying, well, look, Paul's nothing. He gets in trouble all the time. He does all these things. He says, but the truth is, that's what shows my true authority, my true power, is that in my weakness, in my struggles, in my commitment, Christ is known to the world. <laughs> um, and, you know, I often think about the fact that, um, you know, Christianity really is about turning all the normal cultural adages and ways of thinking and stuff upside down. Um, how comfortable are we? And how do we as a church today really claim that reality that we're going to be opposite <laughs> everything the world says is good we are the opposite <laughs> I, I interpret it like that it it seems more like he's just saying it's it's a constant struggle i don't know if he's really i don't know for me yeah. i don't think he's saying that we have to be the opposite well, it's like normal, our... not not going what society considers normal. Mm -hmm. Our mission statement kind of is like that. I mean, we have in there who we accept. A, a lot of people out there don't accept LBGT and immigrants and a lot of things like that. The COVID shot. I mean, I loved in the book of Acts. What's does anybody know what one of the big accusations against the Christians were? They're turning the whole world upside down. <laughs> That's what we, you know, they're reversing everything we think is, is right. So there was an ancient letter that was written. Um, by one of the governors in the Roman Empire to the emperor, trying to figure out what do we do about these Christians? He says, you know, we believe in exposing the weak of our children to, to the elements, but they believe in saving even the weakest among them. We believe that, you know, everybody should be free and doing whatever they want kind of sexually, but they practice this monogamy that seems really strange and out of, you know, where we, um, take revenge on people. They are always forgiving everyone, even as they're being put to death in the arena. What kind of weird people are these? And what do we do about them? <laughs> and I think in his ironic sort of way, that's what Paul is saying, that we as Christians do not gauge ourselves by the standards of the world. We're not going to do that. You know, that's not who we are. We believe in something totally different. So while the, how does the emperor establish what was called the peace of Rome, the Pax Romana? How does the Roman Empire do? What, ask a question again. for Pax How does the Roman Romana? Empire establish the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome? Well, they, they go, the, the, the Roman roads, they can go anywhere where there's anybody causing problems and they can get right to them and stop it. Right. And how do they do that? With a really big army that goes and beats people up every time they do something the Roman Empire doesn't approve of. Um, how do Christians deal with how do they how do they establish peace? By blessing their enemies. <laughs> By giving to those who abuse them. By doing all these strange things, the people of the Roman Empire were like totally confused by Christianity. 
didn't seem to hold any of the standards of what Roman life was really like. And today, I would argue that that's we in our own way are called to the same kind of reality. We don't hold the standards of the world as what standards we hold. Um, we have a different set of values that's mm -hmm. totally alien to what to what's going on out there. Um, I had a, a Old Testament teacher who used to talk about the fact that uh, he was an Austrian and he his family was there when Austria was conquered by the Germans, um, had been in a lot of the political upheaval that went on in Europe. And he said that what he always experienced was that people in power always hated Christians because they weren't in line with what's going on. They were always the, the outsiders who were making trouble for whatever was going on. So um, you had uh, um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer and his group who opposed Hitler um, because they said what he was doing was wrong. Um, you have stories of the Christians in Russia who opposed the power of what was going on. Here in America, Quakers were among those who immediately were against slavery and fought against that. Christians are the ones who've risen up in peace movements throughout uh, our history. We always seem to be out of step. <laughs> and Paul says, you know, all these apostles you've got, they try to establish themselves based on the norms of what the world says. They're good orators. They're powerful. They've got money. Everybody likes them. And Paul says, but that's not how we measure things. We measure things by our life in Christ. Um, so let's go on and see how he continues this out in 2 Corinthians 12, 1 to 10. Somebody want to read that one? This side is done, guys. Okay. I'll read it. Give everybody a break for a minute. It is necessary to boast. Nothing is to gain, be gained by it, but I'll go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body. I do not know. God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard things that are not to be told and that no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such a one, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast except of my weakness. But if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth, but I refrain from it so that no one may think better of me than what is seen in me or heard from me. Even considering the exceptional character of the revelations, therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness." So I will boast all the more gladly of, gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weakness, insults, hardship, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. So what do you think? <laughs> just hammering away at the same kind of uh, understanding of what the relationship is between the Corinthian church there and uh, their, just their apostleship and his. Mm -hmm. I, I just see it continuing. Um, a little bit more of his autobiography here. Three times that this this uh, whatever this uh, uh, disability he had, mm -hmm. I know that's been questioned. Nobody knows. Times. They don't exactly really know what it means. 
It's something that made his life difficult. It was a thorn in the flesh. <laughs> Whether it was a disease or some kind of um, defect, some said sort a of stutter, um, you know, whatever. He says that, you know, I, I wanted God to get rid of this, but what was the answer? My power is made perfect in weakness. No, my my, my grace is sufficient. It's an interesting way to try to gather a following by telling them all your people they have to be miserable to be a follower. <laughs> yeah, it is an interesting sort of approach. Though I don't think he's saying you have to be miserable. He's saying that I'm judging my life on a different set of standards. You would say my life is miserable and terrible, but I, you know. I am sensible. Well, you he haven't. says, when I am weak, then I am strong, which is just the opposite. Right. Right. To convince people of that is a tall order. And he also has said, you know, if I, I wanted. He cares. <laughs> yeah. He says. If I wanted, you know, and he says it more clearly in the previous section, but in this section too, he says it. He says, you know, if I wanted to compare myself to you guys, let's say I really wanted to show that by your standards, I was really great. Think about it. Am I a Jew? Yes. Is I a really faithful Jew? Yes. <laughs> Did I speak to churches with power and start churches up? Yes. By all the standards you're using, I could, I could claim my greatness just like all the other people who are saying they're apostles. But that's not how I think about it. My greatness is found in the fact that I am persecuted for the sake of Christ. My greatness is found in the fact that in my weakness, Christ becomes apparent to the world. Um, these are the ways that I measure my greatness, which isn't really greatness because it's not about me. <laughs> but, you know, the one thing we have to remember is so many of these things that happened to him, he risked his life. So he was willing to die mm -hmm. for Jesus, for the sake of the gospel. Yep. That's that's the ultimate sacrifice. Right. Uh, we don't want to live in weakness alone unless we know that we're willing to go the whole way mm -hmm. for him. That's right. Well, and let's say you could boast in all the things you did. If it wasn't about your weakness. Then what would be the point of Christ? Mm -hmm. <laughs> if I can claim my own righteousness by all the great things I did, then I don't really need Jesus, do I? Yeah. <laughs> it's because we realize that we can't claim that reality, that we realize how important Jesus really is. And that's what Paul is, I think, at the heart of it trying to get to. It's in this brokenness that we realize the true power of Christ, the true love of God, the true grace is in the fact that we can't claim greatness. We can't do that. Just to give you a quick introduction, a lot of people believe that Paul's also playing around um, with uh, this image of, well, there's someone else who had this vision. It's really him he's talking about. And as you get later into it, you can tell he's really just talking about his own vision, his own um, spirituality. And again, he's saying, you know, even if even if I had all this great stuff that I could say spiritually, I had all this, you know, information from God and everything, still doesn't matter. It still doesn't matter. That what's the only word of God he will share with it, with all of them from his vision? My grace is sufficient. <laughs> My strength is made real in weakness. Um, the power of Christ does dwell in him, yeah. even in his weakness. Right. And maybe especially 
in his weakness. Father, forgive them. <laughs> this day you be with me in Christ. So after he said all this, now he gets down to it a little bit with them. Um, somebody want to read 11 through 18? Oh, my Bible, anybody? <laughs> I'll just read. I won't put anybody else on the spot today. I have been a fool. You forced me to it. Indeed, you should have been the ones commending me, for I am not at all inferior to these super apostles, even though I am nothing. The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with utmost patience, signs and wonders and mighty works. How have you been worse off than the other churches, except that I myself did not burden you? Forgive me this wrong. Here I am, ready to come to you this third time, and I will not be a burden, because I do not want what is yours, but you. For children ought not to lay up for their parents, but parents for their children. I will not, I will most gladly spend and be spent for you. If I love you more, am I to be loved less? Let it be assumed that I did not burden you. Nevertheless, you say, since I was crafty, I took you in by deceit. Did I take advantage of you through any of those whom I sent to you? I urged Titus to go and sent the brother with him. Titus did not take advantage of you, did he? Did we not conduct ourselves with the same spirit? Did we not take the same steps? So, Paul's getting ready to go to Corinth. And what does he want to do there? Tell me something. What's the timeline, of Paul, from 1 Corinthians through the, now? How many times was he there? And then he went away. Mm -hmm. And and then he had, was it Titus? No, somebody else come. The, the understanding I have of the timeline, and again, we can't, be real precise on what's going on here, is that Paul came and established the church there. Okay. He went away. He was supposed to come back, but there were certain things that delayed his return. Um, but he heard from Titus, who had come to the to Corinth at first and come back to him, that there were problems there. So he sends the letter of 1 Corinthians to them to kind of try to smooth things over. Um, then he comes and he's like abused by people at Corinth, you know, verbally and kind of um, told, ah, you're not an apostle, get out of here sort of thing. And he goes away from them. And almost immediately after he leaves, he writes what's called the tearful letter. So somehow he pours out to them his anger, his frustration, his pain. Um, and lets them know where he feels, how he feels. And at that time, he says he's going to come again. But again, he's delayed from coming. And we don't know exactly why or for what, though the indication seems in part that he wanted to give a cooling down period <laughs> sometimes. So, so let's let everything kind of work its way out before I try to go there again. Um, and then he writes him this letter. And he says, OK, you know, you think that. And there are all kinds of accusations about why Paul doesn't love him. He didn't come and see us. He didn't take money from us. He didn't, you know, so he must not like us as much as the Macedonians or these people over here. And so Paul writes the letter and says, no, that's not the case at all. I, I love you dearly. One of the reasons I didn't come is because I didn't want to get in a fight with you. And I knew if I came right away, there would be this major sort of disagreement between us. So I delayed. Um, and then he goes into a defense of, you know, I am an apostle. You guys are all wrong in the assessment you have of what it means to be an apostle, a follower of God. Um, it's not the way that you kind of put it all together. Um, and now he's saying, you know, I'm going to come. But he's got, he wants to be honest about them, to them, with them, about what that coming is going to be about. Um, so he's first of all saying that, um, I am an apostle. Think about when I first came, all right? Think about all the incredible things that happened. 
Think about the fact that the church got established. Think about all these things. And then how can you turn around and say, I'm not an apostle. That doesn't make any sense. Um, and, uh, you know, you are now saying that because I didn't take money from you for doing what I'm doing, that I, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> but he goes, I didn't want to take advantage of you. And again, he's got a kind of subtle sort of dig he's doing at these other apostles that they're taking money from you to take advantage of you. And you say they're all great because they do that. <laughs> well, I chose not to, so I wouldn't take advantage of you. In fact, I see you as my children. Parent doesn't you know, expect the children to store up money for them, to take care of them. The parent instead takes care of the kids. And that's exactly what I did. Um, mm. I didn't take advantage of you. I love you and I care about you. Um, and then he goes on in the argument in 19. Have you been thinking all along that we have been defending ourselves before you? We are speaking in Christ before God. Everything we do, beloved, is for the sake of building you up. For I fear that when I come, I may find you not as I wish, and that you may find me not as you wish. I fear that there may perhaps be quarreling and jealousy and anger and selfishness, slander, gossip, conceit, and disorder. I fear that when I come again, my God may humble me before you. And that I may have to mourn over many who previously sinned and have not repented of impurity, sexual immorality, and licentiousness that they have practiced. This is the third time I am coming to you. Any charge must be sustained by the evidence of two or three witnesses. I warn those who sinned previously that all the others are, and all the others and I warn them now while absent as I did when present on my second visit, that if I come again, I will not be lenient. Since you desire proof that Christ is speaking in me, he is not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful in you. For he was crucified in weakness, but lives by the power of God. For we are weak in him, but in dealing with you, we will live with him by the power of God. So. What's he saying to them then? <clears throat> he may say things that they don't want to hear, and he's not he's not going to stop. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> he's been kind of gentle in a way with them up to this point, but no more. If things continue. <laughs> <laughs> At first three is interesting. Since you desire proof that Christ is speaking in me, he is not in dealing with you. In a little threatening undertone <laughs> there. <laughs> Without really coming out and saying, <laughs> right? It's just like <laughs> Yeah, there's you know, they've been saying, Well, you're weak, you're vacillating, you're you know, he's but he says, you know, if you want to see power. This way. <laughs> it's coming to you. Um, but at the same time, he doesn't really want that to happen. He wants them to change so that when he comes, he doesn't have to be confrontative with them anymore. Now, we, you know, a lot of what N.T. Wright says in his book is that not everybody in Corinth is against Paul. I mean, in fact, there's probably lots of them. And probably maybe even the majority who are on Paul's side. But he wants those who know who oppose him to know that, you know, when he comes, he's going to be responsive to those who are calling for those who are breaking up the community to be put in their place. Ah, uh, those <laughs> the rich folks. Some of them probably money, are. Some decisions. <laughs> About people who are jealous of Paul's power they want it no yep. they don't want him to have it well he does yeah we talked about that last time about being threatening to other people sure uh -huh. sure mm -hmm. 
And and as a politics, that's politics. Yeah, well, you know, wherever two or three are gathered together, there's politics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but Paul's not going to allow that to be what shapes his response to what's going on. If I speak, I speak in the power of the Lord, and I say things that have to be said, and not for revenge, not because I'm angry, but because I'm coming to build up the community. And sometimes to build up the community, you have to stand firm against those who are destroying the community. Um, and so Paul's pretty clear that, you know, if I come, that's what you're going to get. So then he goes on to say to them, examine yourself to see whether you are living in faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you fail to meet the test. I hope you will find out that we have not failed. But we pray to God that you may not do anything wrong. Not that we may appear to have met the test, but that you may do what is right, though we may seem to have failed. For we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. For we rejoice when we are weak and you are strong. That's what we pray for, that you may become perfect. So I write these things while I am away from you, so that when I come, I may not have to be severe in using the authority that the Lord has given me for building up and not for tearing down. So he wants them to test themselves. What does it mean to test ourselves? How do we test ourselves? Don't look in here because he doesn't really give you much <laughs> will it be examining our, our ourselves against what we know about christ that would be a pretty powerful way to do it to say how is my life in line with what jesus wants for the world they probably all have they have examples of one another well, that person really seems to have it together. This one doesn't. I don't want to be like that. I'd rather be like him or her. Mm -hmm. That's what Christ wants. Mm -hmm. So who does he write these letters to? I mean, we, we sit here and we think of like what we think of now. You know, somebody says something and everybody in the United States knows what that person said within a half an hour. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, you're writing a piece of paper that gets delivered via camel or something, right? right. So, well, then, so who reads this? Two guys um, at the top or? Most <laughs> scholars think in some form what would happen was that the letter would come to the leadership of the community. But that ultimately political leadership or the, religious leadership. The, yeah, the leader of the leaders of the church. church. So the letter would come to the leaders of the church and it would be presented to the whole congregation. So it would be, and one of my professors from when I was in college, David Rhodes, who is now a seminary professor, he believes that what would happen would be that, you know, it talks in a lot of the letters about somebody being the scribe for Paul, kind of writing all this down and that they probably did write it down but ultimately when they went there they didn't like read it off a page like reading a letter they instead did kind of this presentation of the letter having heard paul speak the words and know what his emphasis was and stuff they would try to communicate it with that same emphasis that same power to the congregation for everyone to hear what Paul had to say. So the letter primarily is meant for certainly the congregation at Corinth. So everybody in, who's in that congregation and possibly this letter even wider to everyone who is in that region, the region of Achaia. So that um, this letter was meant to be shared with everyone. It wasn't just, okay, I'm writing to some one person, like we write letters basically to one person. We, right. don't. <laughs> we don't write to a whole group for the most part, but these letters, that was the primary purpose. It was written to the whole congregation. And, and, and what does that mean in 
historical terms. Is there any understanding of that? What is that whole congregation? Is that 20 people? Is that a little cadre of people uh, tucked away in some house, afraid to be letting themselves known to others in there? You know, what, mm -hmm. what kind of a congregation well, probably, is it? Yeah, they're probably yeah. Is, they're probably bigger than 20 at this point. Probably when Paul starts Corinth, at Corinth, it's a relatively small number. But the congregation has been growing. People have been coming into Christianity. They may have a secretive sort of sense to them because Christianity is not accepted openly throughout the Roman Empire. So there may it be still a still isn't <laughs> throughout the empire. Yeah. So there's probably a certain amount of, yeah, you know, we're not going to go out and <laughs> get in the face of people who are out in the street or whatever. Um, but it's probably bigger by now, you know, and probably... At this point, the church has spread throughout Achaia. So that means there are probably several house churches that are, you know, a part of the, the structure of the church at this point. So you may have, you know, this letter going to several different places to be read as part of the wider um, life of the people of God in that place. And ultimately what happens is these words are so powerful that the whole church decides, well, I guess we all are. Because <laughs> um, it has something to say to all of us about how we look at um, the gospel, how we look at our lives in the gospel. Um, and I think that this last part is especially powerful in that regard, to call on us all the time to be examining our lives. Not in the sense of trying to be perfect, but in seeing the places where we need to be more open to the realities that God is calling us to. Letting go of some of the ways that we um, ground our lives in the values of the day. Um, because those values aren't necessarily always healthy and good for us or keep us close to Christ. Um, and Paul is pretty straightforward about you need to, he, in, in another place, I don't think it was in this section, he calls on them to become mature. Oh, I'm not even sure what mature <laughs> really is. What does that mean? But it does mean that there's some process that needs to go on in us that we're struggling to live out the reality that we're called into. And, and kind of his closing statement lays it out for us in a really interesting way. Um, finally, siblings, farewell. Put things in order. Listen to my appeal. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. And you'll, you've heard me say these last words before sermons and and lots of times, the grace of our the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Oh, you're stealing those words from Paul. Oh, of course oh. I am. Oh, my <laughs> about this? Preachers are always <laughs> take from each other all the time. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> so do we know if if this letter achieved what he wanted it to achieve? No. <laughs> right. We do know from the book of Acts that somehow the collection that was being taken did get to Jerusalem. We do know that the tensions between the Jerusalem church and the Gentile church um, were constantly being worked on and that Paul was a part of that process. Um, we do get some pictures of Paul's interaction with various of the churches, but exactly how this came out? No, we have, we have this letter. <laughs> um, but, I'm, you know, I, I found it interesting. N.T. Wright especially focused on that last verse that 
preachers all the time kind of use. Mm -hmm. um, and he asked some questions. What does it mean to live in grace? And so he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. What is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we live into? Love. Okay. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Yeah. Forgiveness. Kindness. Okay. What does grace actually mean? The word itself. Laid on us. Unmerited favor. Okay. An unmerited gift. Mm -hmm. So he's saying, may this gift of Jesus Christ be yours. This unmerited gift. So don't run around trying to measure up or whatever. You live in grace. And how do you, and probably is also in some way saying, Live as graciously and generously as God has lived with you. Because remember, he's building up to the big collection thing. So, you know, there's probably an implication in there, too. Of you've received everything by grace. Then let that grace empower you to be who you are. Um, and what does the love of God look like? Unconditional. Unconditional. Sacrificial. Sacrificial. Eternal. Eternal. All of these things are true. And interestingly enough, for God, God is love is not something God does. Love uh, is yes. the very center of God's being. So in some ways, how does that how is that love at the center of your being? You know, he's talking about asking themselves questions, testing themselves. How is that love at work in you? How is that love the very essence of who you are? And what's the fellowship of the Holy Spirit? It's right here at this table. Okay. Or always with us. Always with us. And it crosses. Being in one of one mind, or yep, pulling people together across boundaries, across differences, we become what the word koinonia gets used a lot in in Paul's letters. It means the fellowship, the community, the sharing. That's what the Holy Spirit does: is that binds you together in that, pulls you together into that reality. Um, and in a way, Paul is also saying ties me together with you too. I haven't given up on you. <laughs> I'm still planning to come. That's the power of the Holy Spirit that draws us together and will not let us go. Which is a pretty powerful way to end the book. So any other thoughts from anyone? Pastor John, you want to? <laughs> yeah, brother. Praise the Lord. Yeah. As we all know that uh, there are the seven books of the Holy Spirit, like uh, it will give us wisdom, understanding, the counsel, a knowledge, and fear of the Lord. These kind of things uh, we'll get from the this fellowship. Like uh, Paul says, uh, don't neglect uh, to be in the fellowship. Like in Hebrews, he says that... Uh, do not neglect to be in the fellowship. So fellowship is a, a kind of a, a place where we have mutual cooperation. Okay, learning together. Okay, this is also a kind of fellowship where we have the exchange of ideas. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad uh, to be a part of your fellowship to know uh, different uh, things from your experience, Pastor. I'm really blessed though I am all the way from India. I got a chance. It's happened to meet you this way. And uh, fellowship uh, is very much important. As uh, we are all called to be in the fellowship of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we have. Okay. He's the one who called us. The one who called us is faithful. So it's uh, nothing but koinonia. As we all know that. Uh, okay. Koinonia means a fellowship. As in mutual cooperation. Okay, the fellowship produces 
a mutual cooperation in God's worship, God's work and God's willing being done in the world. Okay, so God's will will be done with this fellowship. Like we we learn some things here. It's like Paul is an example for us here. So as he say that uh, I am imitating Lord Jesus Christ and you imitate me. So sometimes we need to okay focus on that things and thank you very much for uh, your time, Pastor. Thank you. Well, thank Please you for joining us. Pray. You're a blessing yeah, to us. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Our fellowship is global. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yes. Yep. Yeah, that's a good thing. Yes, yes, it is. So I'm just curious, what is your next topic for Bible study? Well, you for the plan? summer, we're taking off from Bible study. Instead, okay. we're having people in the group here lead discussions on various concerns of theirs. Mm -hmm. So okay. for most weeks, I'll try to have something set up where you can join us if you'd like. Sure, brother. I love to do that. All right. So, yeah. You you just let me know uh, through mail or uh, so that I will be, okay, try to uh, be in the fellowship. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. God bless.